Hello, everybody. Welcome back for the evening reading. Tonight we are reading from Letters to a Young Poet by Rainer Maria Rilke, who is an Austrian poet and novelist. Uh, this book was sent to me by my friend Maria. And I actually just today was working with a friend named Rainer. And then I also had another friend, uh, my friend Rosa Two, who is an incredibly talented musician. And you guys should all check her stuff out. She was on the podcast. And she had posted uh, one of his poems today. So it's just a Rainer Maria Rilke kind of day. So we're going to do it. Uh, as the title suggests, Letters to a Young Poet, this was a, a correspondence between Rilke and a man named Kappus. Uh, Kappus was uh, a younger man who had reached out to Rilke because I think they'd gone to the same school. And the young man was trying to figure out which way to go in life. He was in between going to uh, join the army, um, I believe in Austria. Uh, or to pursue a life as an artist. And so he'd reached out to Rilke because uh, Rilke had, I think, at the time started to get a little bit of uh, traction in the world. And so he wanted, he wanted Rilke's advice. So this correspondence grew from that place. And yeah, it's just a wonderful uh, exploration of being young and finding your way is what I would say. And it also has a lot of great insights about uh, loneliness, sadness, and how to navigate through some of life's more confusing times and, and trusting in the intelligence of the universe, right? So Rilke is an incredible poet. And so in that spirit, I'm not going to probably unpack any of these words. I'm just going to read it straight tonight. Um, but maybe at the end, I'll layer in on top with, with some thoughts if, uh, if I feel inspired. But we've got about 16 pages to polish off together, but they're pretty thin, you know, pretty, pretty well spaced out. So cozy up for a bit and hope you enjoy it. All right, we're reading from page 81, chapter 8. This is from August 12th, 1904. Rilke is writing from Sweden at this point. He begins. I want to talk to you again for a little while, dear Mr. Kappas, although there is almost nothing I can say that will help you, and I can hardly find one useful word. You have had many sadnesses, large ones, which passed. And you say that even this passing was difficult and upsetting for you. But please ask yourself whether these large sadnesses haven't rather gone right through you. Perhaps many things inside you have been transformed. Perhaps somewhere, someplace deep inside your being, you have undergone important changes while you were sad. The only sadnesses that are dangerous and unhealthy are the ones that we carry around in public in order to drown them out with the noise. Like diseases that are treated superficially and foolishly, they just withdraw, and after a short interval, break out again all the more terribly, and gather inside us and our life, our life that is unlived, rejected, lost, life that we can die of. Just to be clear, the spelling here is not our life, not possessive, but are. So he's saying that our sadnesses are life. They are a key dimension of our life that is unlived, rejected, lost. So the point is that we must own them, claim them. Um, don't over-identify with them, but don't ignore them. He continues, if only it were possible for us to see farther than our knowledge reaches and even a little beyond the outworks of our presentiment, perhaps we would bear our sadnesses with greater trust than we have in our joys. For they are the moments when something new has entered us, something unknown. Our feelings grow mute in shy embarrassment. 
everything in us withdraws, a silence arises, and the new experience, which no one knows, stands in the midst of it all and says nothing. It seems to me that almost all our sadnesses are moments of tension, which we feel as paralysis, because we no longer hear our astonished emotions living. Because we are alone with the unfamiliar presence that has entered us, because everything we trust and are used to is for a moment taken away from us. Because we stand in the midst of a transition where we cannot remain standing. Let me read that one more time. Because we are alone with the unfamiliar presence that has entered us, because everything we trust and are used to is for a moment taken away from us, because we stand in the midst of a transition where we cannot remain standing. That is why the sadness passes. The new presence inside us, the presence that has been added, has entered our heart, has gone into its innermost chamber, and is no longer even there, is already in our bloodstream. And we don't know what it was. We could easily be made to believe that nothing happened, and yet we have changed as a house that a guest has entered changes. We could easily be made to believe that nothing happened, and yet we have changed as a house, as a house that a guest has entered changes. We can't say who has come. Perhaps we will never know. But many signs indicate that the future enters us in this way in order to be transformed in us long before it happens. And that is why it is so important to be solitary and attentive when one is sad. Because the seemingly uneventful and motionless moment when our future steps into us is so much closer to life than that other loud and accidental point of time when it happens to us as if from outside. One more time. And that is why it is so important to be solitary and attentive when one is sad, because the seemingly uneventful and motionless moment when our future steps into us is so much closer to life than that other loud and accidental point of time when it happens to us as if from outside. The quieter we are, the more patient and open we are in our sadnesses, the more deeply and serenely the new presence can enter us, and the more we can make it our own, the more it becomes our fate. And later on, when it happens, that is, steps forth out of us to other people, we will feel related and close to it in our innermost being. And that is necessary. It is necessary and toward this point, our development will move little by little, that nothing alien, hmm. my mouth made a really weird sound, so we're going to play that back. It is necessary, and toward this point, our development will move little by little, that nothing alien happened to us, but only what has long been our own. People have already had to rethink so many concepts of motion, and they will also gradually come to realize that what we call fate does not come into us from the outside, but emerges from us. It is only because so many people have not absorbed and transformed their fates while they were living in them, that they have not realized what was emerging from them. It was so alien to them that in their confusion and fear, they thought it must have entered them at the very moment they became aware of it, for they swore they had never before found anything like that inside them. Just as people for a long time had a wrong idea about the sun's motion, they are even now wrong about the motion of what is to come. The future stands still, dear Mr. Kappas, that we move in infinite space. How could it not be difficult for us? And to speak of solitude again, it becomes clearer and clearer that fundamentally this is nothing that one can choose or refrain from. We are solitary. We can delude ourselves about this and act as if it were not true. That is all. But how much better it is to recognize that we are alone. Yes, even to begin from this realization. It will, of course, make us dizzy. 
For all points that our eyes used to rest on are taken away from us. There is no longer anything near us, and everything far away is infinitely far. Let's take that from the top one more time, because there's, there's a lot in that. And to speak of solitude again, it becomes clearer and clearer that fundamentally, this is nothing that one can choose or refrain from. We are solitary. We can delude ourselves about this and act as if it were not true. That is all. But how much better it is to recognize that we are alone. Yes, even to begin from this realization. It will, of course, make us dizzy. For all points that our eyes used to rest on are taken away from us. There is no longer anything near us, and everything far away is infinitely far. A man taken out of his room, and almost without preparation or transition, placed on the heights of a great mountain range, would feel something like that, an unequaled insecurity, an abandonment to the nameless, would almost annihilate him. He would feel he was falling, or think he was being catapulted out into space, or exploded into a thousand pieces. What a colossal lie his brain would have to invent in order to catch up with and explain the situation of his senses. That is how all distances, all measures, change for the person who becomes solitary. Many of these changes occur suddenly, and then, as with the man on the mountaintop, unusual fantasies and strange feelings arise, which seem to grow out beyond all that is bearable. But it is necessary for us to experience that too. We must accept our reality as vastly as we possibly can. Everything, even the unprecedented, even the unprecedented must be possible within it. One more time. We must accept our reality as vastly as we possibly can. Everything, even the unprecedented, must be possible within it. This is, in the end, the only kind of courage that is, requ that is required of us. The courage to face the strangest, most unusual, most inexplicable experiences that can meet us. One more time. <clears throat> this is, in the end, the only kind of courage that is required of us, the courage to face the strangest, most unusual, most inexplicable experiences that can meet us. The fact that people have in this sense been cowardly has done infinite harm to life. The experiences that are called apparitions, the whole so-called spirit world, death, all these things that are so closely related to us have through our daily defensiveness been so entirely pushed out of life that the senses with which we might have been able to grasp them have atrophied. So forgive me. I know I said I was just going to read this straight, guys. But, uh, but yeah, so Rilke spent a lot of his life in solitude. I think he had a very rocky marriage for a while, and then I believe it didn't work out, and he just spent a lot of his time working in solitude. And so that's where a lot of his, his insights come from. But by most accounts, he was also a mystic who had a lot of, as we're seeing here, very profound uh, experiences with that dimension of life. And you, you see this quite often across a lot of the more introspective literature is this idea that our, our modern mind, our rational, logical brain that has been conditioned to operate within society has become closed off to this dimension of life, this spiritual dimension of life. So let's go back to what he said. He says, the fact that people have in this sense been cowardly has done infinite harm to life. And he means cowardly in terms of, you know, not not being courageous in terms of meeting your solitude, of really meeting your aloneness, your individuality. And yes, I know at the deepest level, we're all connected. It's all one thing underneath it all. 
but you're still experiencing life as an individual. And that's, that's part of the deal. But what he's saying here is that there is this, this deeper dimension that we all can gain access to as we make the most out of our aloneness, out of our solitude. So the fact that people have in this sense been cowardly has done infinite harm to life. The experiences that are called apparitions, the whole, the whole so-called spirit world, death, all these things, capital T, things, that are so closely related to us have through our daily defensiveness been so entirely pushed out of life that the senses with which we might have been able to grasp them have atrophied, to say nothing of God. But the fear of the inexplicable has not only impoverished the reality of the individual, it has also narrowed the relationship between one human being and another which has, as it were, been lifted out of the riverbed of infinite possibilities and set down in a fallow place on the bank where nothing happens. God damn, that's a great sentence, isn't it? All right, let's play it back. Just close your eyes on this one. Listen to this guy. This guy's dropping some heat. But the fear of the inexplicable has not only impoverished the reality of the individual, it has also narrowed the relationship between one human being and another, which has, as it were, been lifted out of the riverbed of infinite possibilities and set down in a fallow place on the bank where nothing happens. For those that are maybe not familiar with um, farming, fallow means when you don't, you know, uh, when a, a field is essentially left and you don't plant it. You, you give it time to essentially replenish its nutrients and, you know, plant it a season later. So what he's saying here is that our relationships as human beings have been pulled out of the richness of the riverbed, right? Which is where all the, the really, you know, nutritious sediment and, you know, um, the richest soils sit in that riverbed and they've been put over in this field where nothing's happening, right? So he says, which has, as it were, been lifted out of the riverbed of infinite possibilities and set down in a fallow place on the bank where nothing happens. For it is not only indolence that causes human relationships to be repeated from case to case with such unspeakable monotony and boredom. It is timidity before any new inconceivable experience, which we don't think we can deal with. But only someone who is ready for everything, who doesn't exclude any experience, even the most incomprehensible, will live the relationship with another person as something alive and will himself sound the depths of his own being. For if we imagine this being of the individual as a large as a larger or smaller room, it is obvious that most people come to know only one corner of their room, one spot near the window, one narrow strip on which they keep walking back and forth. In this way, they have a certain security. And yet how much more human is the dangerous insecurity that drives those prisoners in posed stories to feel out the shapes of their horrible dungeons and not be strangers to the unspeakable terror of their cells. Uh, Poe is a reference to, I believe, Edgar Allan Poe, but I'm not 100% sure. Play it back one more time. For if we imagine this being of the individual as a larger or smaller room, it is obvious that most people come to know only one corner of their room, one spot near the window, one narrow strip on which they keep walking back and forth. In this way, they have a certain security. And yet, how much more human is the dangerous insecurity that drives those prisoners in posed stories to fill out the shapes of their horrible dungeons and not be strangers to the unspeakable terror of their cells? We, however, are not prisoners. 
No traps or snares have been set around us, and there is nothing that should frighten or upset us. We have been put into life as into the element we most accord with, and we have, moreover, through thousands of years of adaptation, come to resemble this life so greatly that when we hold still through a fortunate mimicry, we can hardly be differentiated from everything around us. We have no reason to harbor any mistrust against our world, for it is not against us. If it has terrors, they are our terrors. If it has abysses, these abysses belong to us. If there are dangers, we must try to love them. And if we only arrange our life in accordance with the principle which tells us that we must always trust in the difficult, then what now appears to us as the most alien will become our most intimate and trusted experience. Well, if it has terrors, there are terrors. I'm sorry. If it has terrors, they are our terrors. Again, not, not pushing away life, not pushing away the bad stuff, not living life at arm's length, embracing all of it, good and bad. If it has abysses, these abysses belong to us. If, they are, if there are dangers, we must try to love them. And if only we arrange our life in accordance with the principle, which tells us, that we must always trust in the difficult, then what now appears to us as the most alien will become our most intimate and trusted experience. How could we forget those ancient myths that stand at the beginning of all races, the myths about dragons that at the last moment are transformed into princesses? Perhaps all the dragons in our lives are princesses who are only waiting to see us act just once with beauty and courage. Perhaps everything that frightens us is, in its deepest essence, something helpless that wants our love. So you mustn't be frightened, dear Mr. Kappas, if a sadness rises in front of you, larger, larger than any you've ever seen, if an anxiety like light and cloud shadows moves over your hands and over everything you do. You must realize that something is happening to you, that life has not forgotten you, that it holds you in its hand and will not let you fall. Why do you want to shut out your life, any uneasiness, any misery, any depression, since after all, you don't know what work these conditions are doing inside you? Why do you want to persecute yourself with the question of where all this is coming from and where it is going, since you know, after all, that you are in the midst of transitions and you wish for nothing so much as to change? If there is anything unhealthy in your reactions, just bear in mind that sickness is the means by which an organism frees itself from what is alien. So one must simply help it to be sick, to have its whole sickness, and to break out with it, since that is the way it gets better. In you, dear Mr. Kappas, so much is happening now. You must be patient like someone who is sick and confident like someone who is recovering for perhaps you are both. And more, you are also the doctor who has to watch over himself. See how it keeps on coming back, guys, to being in charge of yourself here, accountability. It's consistent across all the great introspective thinkers, teachers, poets, you name it. You're responsible for you, right? personal sovereignty, responsibility. So he says, you are also the doctor who has to watch over himself. But in every sickness, there are many days when the doctor can do nothing but wait. And that is what you, and so far as you are your own doctor, must now do more than anything else. Don't observe yourself too closely. Don't be too quick to draw conclusions from what happens to you. Simply let it happen. Right? Kind of echoing that Taoist idea of non-doing or Wu Wei. Simply let it happen. Otherwise, it will be too easy for you to look with blame, that is, morally, at your past 
which naturally has a share in everything that now meets you. But whatever errors, wishes, and yearnings of your boyhood are operating in you now are not what you remember and condemn. The extraordinary circumstances of a solitary and helpless childhood are so difficult, so complicated, surrendered to so many influences, and at the same time so cut off from all real connection with life, that where a vice enters it, one may not simply call it a vice. One must be so careful with names anyway. It is so often the name of an offense that a life shatters upon, not the nameless and personal action itself, which was perhaps a quite definite necessity of that life and could have been absorbed by it without any trouble. And the expenditure of energy seems to you so great only because you overvalue victory. It is not the great thing that you think you have achieved, although you are right about your feeling. The great thing is that there was already something there which you could replace that deception with, something true and real. Without this, even your victory would have been just a moral reaction of no great significance. But in fact, it has become a part of your life. Your life, dear Mr. Kappas, which I think of with so many good wishes. Do you remember how that life yearned out of childhood toward the great thing? I see that it is now yearning forth beyond the great thing toward the greater one. That is why it does not cease to be difficult but that is also why it will not cease to grow. So trusting the difficult. And he closes with this final paragraph. And if there is one more thing that I must say to you, it is this. Don't think that the person who is trying to comfort you now lives untroubled among the simple and quiet words that sometimes give you pleasure. His life has much trouble and sadness and remains far behind yours. If it were otherwise, he would have never been able to find those words. Yours, Rainer Maria Rilke. That's what I got tonight, guys. I hope it resonates. I hope it uh, strikes a chord in you all. It definitely has in me every time I return to it. And... Yeah, I think if there's one thing I would add on top. It's just that this is a weird time. It's just a weird time. And it is a attractive at times to, to fall into endless distraction or endless busyness, you know, filling your days to the brim to try to run away from things that, that don't feel good or make you uncomfortable. But if there is one thing that is consistent across uh, poets and psychologists and philosophers and every other kind of inner explorer, it is that every experience has something in it for us good, bad, positive, negative, there is, there's a lesson inside everything. And so in that spirit, and in the spirit of being your own doctor, um, be there for yourself, be attentive to what's arising within you. And we'll get through this. All right. Have a good night.